Resilience. Uh, it's a favorite topic of mine given my life history and so many of the clients that I work with. A therapeutic approach to improving performance and health, performance and health, um, moving from micro adjuster to macro adapter using what I like to call a balanced wellness approach. And you're going to learn about all of those terms as we go. I've been doing this a couple of years. Um, it's sometimes kind of embarrassing to go, wow, 20 years plus. I put the plus after I, after I hit 20 and I'm not going to elaborate how many years I've been a PT now. Um, but I've been a strength and conditioning coach for many years and a cyclist and a racer for 25 plus and again to the plus. Worked with a lot of Olympians, worked with a lot of teams across all disciplines, mostly cycling, um, but across all, all disciplines. And I do a lot of um, getting people comfortable on their bikes. I've uh, been certified for, as a fitter for a, a bunch of different organizations and teach uh, nationally and internationally for a bunch of different organizations. With that being said, um, so much of the learning I've done in my life uh, has been through my own body and through my clients, not just some of the hoops I've jumped through. And some of the, um, the most, um, uh, some of the best learning I've done is, uh, is through tonight. So about 15 or so years ago, I was out riding with a friend of mine and he said, you know, Curtis, you just took a fall and you got up and you, um, you got back on your bike and you kept going pretty quickly, not a big deal. But you know, I'm about, I'm about 20 years older than you. And as you get older, you're gonna start to understand what the pumpkin factor is about. And I said, the pumpkin factor, what in the world do you mean by the pumpkin factor? And he said, Curtis, when you're young, you really bounce like a ball. But when you get old, you splat like a pumpkin. You don't get up quite as quickly as you used to as we get older. He was talking about resilience. He was talking about really how do we stay young as we get older. An inspiration of mine, Phil Cavell, ex-professional cyclist, in talking about resilience, was using some of the language we use in bike fitting. And that language is micro-adjuster and macro-adapter. Here's what I mean by that. A micro-adjuster, someone who that seat height has to be just right, that stem has to be just the right length, or that pedal has to be just right. Or in real life, it looks like this. This was an email I got from a client of mine. I wonder, do we need one extra pillow per decade of life? A pillow under my head, a pillow over my head, a pillow between my knees. <laughs> you know, this is someone whose body can't adapt very well. And on the other side of that, injured rider crushes a pro row race, just crushes it. This guy, it doesn't matter. Alex said, hey, the seat height's the wrong height. It doesn't matter. The pedals are wrong. It doesn't matter. My body can adapt to just about anything you throw at it. This guy was resilient. This guy could adapt. If you threw him in the wrong office chair, it doesn't matter. You give him the wrong pair of shoes to take a run, it doesn't matter. His body can adapt. He's a macro adapter versus my friend. He's a micro absorber. So my story as a, as a cyclist, um, mountain biker and road biker, never on the elite pro levels, but I've had enough time on the bike to do a couple of over the handlebars. I don't know whether you guys have done any of that. <laughs> Nothing broke, broken, thankfully, but I hit hard enough at one point in time to end up with some cervical discs, some lumbar discs, and was even hit hard enough to end up off work for a good six months. Uh, bilateral upper extremity, lower extremity pain, it was really quite challenging is the truth. And um, what I learned in going through that process of coming back to resilience has taught me a lot. One of the biggest things that it's taught me, and we'll talk a lot about that process tonight, is I believe through my experience and through a lot of my clients' experiences that we have untapped potential. And that any age we can return to health and we can return to joy. Now, of course, you know, we haven't found the fountain of youth though, maybe we actually have. But we can certainly get younger next year. Uh, you can kind of see it in the edge here, turning back our biological clock. And turning back our biological clock, maybe even differentiating it from our chronological clock. So how do we do that? How do we start to turn down our back our biological clock and make it a little bit more resilient, a little more adaptable, a whole lot less absorbent to the world around us? I like to think about this as a balanced wellness account. We'll talk a lot about what I mean by that as we go through tonight's slide. Objectives tonight, understand what I mean by a balanced wellness account. Identify where you might be low in that account. What are some of the places you want might add a, add a little bit of cash or a little bit of health. 
and understand what are some of the possible deposits. How do you put money or health into that account and maybe some withdrawals for some of the pieces of the pie. So with that, I think this was said really well. So many people just live and it's not the number of years, it's really the life in your years. World Health Organization, and I really love the end of this, it's not merely the absence of disease or infirmity, really it's the mental, the social uh, wellness. This, is, um, this picture was taken by a client of mine who is an elite level cyclist and said, how do I start to do other things besides just cycling? How can I start to learn something fun and interesting to get my brain working better? We'll talk a little bit more about Greg later on. So wellness, uh, another inspiration for this was the Blue Zones. Uh, Butner said, if I look across the entire world, who lives the longest and who has the most joy as they live? Uh, Okinawa, Loma Linda, Sardinia. Um, just the number of centenarians uh, were 3x greater than anywhere else in the world. And the blue zones are the places they overlapped. We'll go into those as we go through tonight's slide, some of the things that overlap between one area and the next. I've divided, um, I've divided this in four pieces of the pie, four pie slices, if you will. If you want wellness, you think about it in four different ways. Number one, let's work on our physical wellness account. Number two, intellectual, let's grow our mind. Number three, emotions, how do we feel, what's our state of being, and finally social and or spiritual. So that's wellness. Next, let's talk about what I mean by an account. You know, An account for me is just like any other account. It's an account that you can put money into, a bank account. It's an account that you can take money out of. And just like any financial bank account, we can make deposits into that account. Or what happens for most of us is, you know, maybe we have a loss of a spouse. Maybe we're not quite sleeping real well. You know, maybe we take a trauma or a fall. Ah, hey, we start to sleep a little more. We start to eat right. And then life kind of marches on. And sooner or later, we get in this zone here, where whether it's pain or anxiety or frustration, and we start bouncing checks. Over life, our potential wellness goes down, but usually our wellness is way down here and our potential wellness is up here. So as a friend of mine once said, actually, Justin, who's in the audience, he said, many times people's biological age well exceeds their chronological age. Their biological age well exceeds their chronological age. And I wanna be other end of this. I wanna start to move the arrow the right direction. If you're not assessing, you're guessing. So these are some of the websites and um, you can pull these up after the fact where you can start to actually assess where you're at in your wellness account. Get a sense of you know, what, um, what your wellness account is loaded up to be. And I just want you to take a moment to think about it for a second. If, um, if you had to say, you know, hey, I'm 60 and I'm actually feeling like I'm five years younger or 10 years younger. So I'm 60 chronologically, but biologically I feel a whole lot younger. For me, I'm 47, and as I start to jump into some of these questionnaires, I find them I'm a couple years younger. So just think about it for a second. If you had to differentiate your biological and your chronological age, where would you guys be at? Where would you guys be at? Just toss that around. And as you go through the rest of the lecture, get a sense, okay, what things can I do to start to increase my health so that way I decrease my biological age? So that's wellness, number one. Number two, what do I mean by balance? Uh, because in truth, if we're not in balance, then things start to crash. For so many of us, instead of being in balance, we end up having one piece of the pie quite, uh, uh, quite a bit more than other pieces. I see this a lot in the population I work with. They have a whole lot of physical health. This is my elite level Ironman triathlete. This is my elite level cyclist, my Olympian. And their, their physical health is so much that they've actually started to borrow a little bit from their emotional. They don't sense into their feelings, into their being. Um, their physical health is so much they've stolen a little bit maybe from their social connections. They're in the gym, they're 25, 35 hours on the bike or in the running. Or on the other side of it, I see this a lot in the Valley. A lot of my CEOs and venture capitals walk in as disembodied heads, right? They're just freaking brainiacs, venture capital, MD, PhD. They're disembodied heads. They, um, they're just so bloody smart. But then you start to talk to them about their social account. How well do they connect with their family? How much time are they spending out on group rides versus just be beating themselves up the mountain? So think about how balanced are you? 
Think about how much money do you have across all of your accounts versus are you out of balance in one way or another? So speaking of out of balance, I just want you to think about this question. What's your fullest account? If you had to pick amongst these four, and we're gonna go into the depths of each one of these, if you had to pick amongst each of these four, where do you put most of your energy at? Where do you put the least amount of energy at? What's your least full account? Think about it for a second. Yeah, for me, it's so easy to get, uh, to jump into all the physical training, so easy to accomplish, you know, get me a little more wattage on the power meter. Next thing I know, I'm not connecting as well with my wife at home, or I'm not getting out on the group rides because I care more about uh, winning that king of the mountain. So where's your physical account at? I'm going to dive deep into the physical side of things um, here, really deep into the physical, and we'll talk a little bit about how to start to put money into the other pieces of that account, uh, but deep into the physical. One of my favorite quotes, and I see too many people that are at age 50, 60, and 70 go, boy, I wish I'd started taking care of my body 10, 15, 20 years ago, because too often, more energy, more time, more money into our cars than we do into our bodies. And just to reference back to that, you know, we just have to start to take care of our bodies because it's the only place we have to live. So physical deposits. Most of my clients say, you know, I need to train more. I need to put more time in on the bike. I need to run more. And they just totally neglect, unlike Lindsey Vaughn and so many other Olympic athletes, they totally un neglect the sleep. So the sleep is really, the training is the seed, and sleep is watering that seed. Um, Olympic marathon runner Ryan Hall, sleep is huge in my sport. Recovery is the limiting factor. Not training, recovery is the limiting factor, not my ability to run hard. The average Olympian, nine, nine and a half hours, and then they take naps in the afternoon. Naps in the afternoon. So not just for performance, but also think about this from a work standpoint. Work benefits, wouldn't we all like a 15% raise? For those people who aren't getting enough sleep, research shows sleep can give us a 15% raise because our memories are better, our creativity is better, our joy and our happiness goes up just because we sleep more. And we go, I don't have time for sleep. Well, maybe we don't have enough energy not to sleep more. And all the cardiovascular benefits and all of the stress and all the brain benefits, maybe if you want your next PR goal, maybe if you want your next king of the mountain, or maybe you just want to get better at, at integrating in your household, better with your kids or better with your spouse, maybe it's time to sleep a little bit more. Tick that up from six and a half maybe to seven, or goodness sakes, from eight and a half to nine if you have that ability. Next. Let's talk a little bit about nutrition. Oh, that's saying we are what we eat. Uh, Michael Pollan's probably got some of the best work out there, at least for me. Um, eat real food. You know, if your grandma didn't recognize the ingredient, you know, and if it's in the middle of the supermarket, you know, it's probably worth skipping. Eat real food. If it's got more than five or six ingredients in it, it's probably worth skipping. Mostly plants, right? Mostly plants. If you looked at back to the, um, the blue zones, they ate a lot of legumes, a lot of plants. Of course, en enough lean protein, enough healthy fats, really critical. But six, seven, eight servings of vegetables a day. And don't eat too much. Quite simple. Don't eat too much. Otherwise, it gets us in trouble. This was important enough for a lot of the elite level cyclists I work with that they hired Alan Lim to follow them around on their, their high level races and Alan would feed them, feed zone portables, Alan would feed them from one race to the next and one stage to the next. The, what, the, um, what the race organizers were providing just wasn't good enough to be able to fuel their bodies. And this is a great book, The Feed Zone Portables, because when you're out on a ride you don't necessarily eat, need to eat all the processed stuff. You can actually have potatoes or you can have little rice um, goodies. It works really well. So eat lots of healthy food, lots of real food, and prefer go for the anti-inflammatory stuff. 
uh, because that stuff it makes your gut a lot healthier. It doesn't send our joints into a lot of issue. It actually makes our brain healthier when we eat anti-inflammatory foods. A lot of us have allergies to fill in the blank, milk or gluten, or um, some of us have allergies, most of actually allergies to sugar. At least sugar can be inflammatory. So eat a lot of anti-inflammatory foods, or at least know what those foods are that set your system off, and pay attention to those. You know, what makes you gassy, or what makes your brain fog a little bit. Uh, Dr. Hyman has spoke a lot about this, and his 10-day uh, detox and some of the other work he's done um, it can really be beneficial to look into. Because when I get to be her age. I am Ernestine Shepard, 80 years of age. I bench press 110 pounds. I started training at age 71. I was named the oldest female competitive bodybuilder at the Guinness Book of World Records. So many people just say, hey, it's just too late. I'm 50, I'm 60, I'm 70. It's just not too late to get healthier. So when we're young, we, we start out with a mansion of possibilities of movement. We can move forward and backward. We can move up and down. We can rotate. Our bodies and our brains have lots of possibilities to think creatively and to move in ways. You watch babies move, and you watch little kids think, and they just think and move outside of the box that we've created for ourselves. We have mansions of possibility of movement. But then what happens to us? This happens to us. We get in an accident. We have a trauma. We crush a helmet. That's not mine, that's one of my clients, but I've got a helmet that looks similarly at home. And those accidents, those injuries, that trauma, that way of thinking, they get us in ruts of movement. So we can't think outside of the boxes that we put ourselves in. We can't move outside of the straitjacket of movement that these traumas have given us. And sooner or later, we're bouncing checks. We're sitting down here in the zone of pain, and where I usually see people is down here, but they don't recognize when we're sitting right there. They've got $5 in their account, and they bend over to pick up the pencil. They've got $20 in the account, and they decide to increase their mileage too fast. And they said, yesterday I was fine. But they didn't think about what had been happening over the years. My first trauma, my not enough sleep. Oh, I'm doing better. I'm eating better. Oh, I'm doing better. I'm sleeping better. I oh, don't know. I'm going to put a lot of work hours in, bend over to pick up the pencil or the grandkid or whatever it is. And our potential is way up here. You look at Olympic athletes, um, age Olympic athletes, and they're losing about a half a percent or a percent a year. They, they're not down here. They're way up here. This is where Ernestine lives. Their biological age is quite low. Their physiological health is quite high. But so many people walk in here. And I just want to start adding some health into that account. So how do we add some health into that account? How do we put some money back into that physical account first? Most of the time, um, we first, let's explore the interconnectedness of the body. Really start to understand that the body is not um, an arm and a leg, but the body is really just like a bicycle wheel. Every spoke connects to every other spoke. So if you've got a, a weak core on one side and a tight hamstring on the other side, then the next thing you know, your low back on the opposite side of the wheel is affected. None of these spokes are touching one another, but they're an interconnected system. So when that system is working well, our bodies are in balance, side to side, forward and backward, right and left. Left. And so because it's such a system, we need to really look through the body as a whole to figure out where things are coming from. So if we understand it as a system, if I'm going to start to help somebody get better, then I need to really find a cause. Where is this problem truly coming from? I need to be, along with my patient, the inspector. Because most of the time, people walk in with something that hurts. You know, maybe it's my hamstring that I just strained. Maybe it's my knee, my patellar tendonitis that hurts. And so often, as you're going to see in my example, so often the pain is in one place, but we end up aiming there instead of looking through the system. We end up treating the victim instead of finding the criminal. Maybe the criminal is a hip or a foot, and the knee is what hurts. And just because it hurts, maybe it's the knee, maybe it's the back, doesn't necessarily mean it's causing the problem, right? So often we treat this poor victim and we don't go looking for the criminal. 
So if number one is um, look at the body as a whole, number two is figure out where something's actually coming from, number three is let's look at a comprehensive rehab program to start to treat that problem. Because most of the time, we focus on one of these three as opposed to all of these three. And we'll go into depth of each one of them, work on the mobility of the system, loosen up what's tight, uh, strengthen the core, strengthen those deep muscles that make a difference in the quality of movement. And then finally, we need to look at retraining the body to move better. This is Eric, a professional cyclist I worked with a couple years ago, and um, Eric's chief complaint was knee pain. You can actually kind of see why as you watch his knee drop to the inside. He had a fair bit of right knee pain on the bike, and we'll figure out where that's coming from as we go. Eric's left knee did a really great job of tracking up and down. You can see it here. The research shows that people whose knees deviate from side to side are about 3x, three times the likelihood to have knee pain is for, versus people whose knees are going up and down. And it doesn't mean the knee's necessarily the problem. It might be coming from somewhere else, as you'll see with Eric. Eric's knee was um, about 2x the deviation as it was on this side. This is just a vertical tracing of a motion capture system I use a fair bit in the clinic called Retool. So Eric was stuck between a rock and a hard place. The rock was his hip. His hip on his left side, the opposite side, he had knee pain. His hip actually was quite stiff. Every time he'd come up over the pedal, he'd get jammed up and over. His left hip would get stuck, pushing him onto his right side, and his right knee would go in. His left hip, 120 degrees of flexion. His right hip, his ability to bring his knee toward his chest, uh, 20 more degrees. So what that meant was that his left hip was pushing into his right knee. I need to get my hands on his hip. I need to mobilize some of the soft tissues and his glutes, his butt, mobilize his hip joint. And of course, I needed to send him home with exercises to do the same. Um, Eric, like so many of my clients, had taken a fall onto that hip, left hip. That never happens, right? We never fall onto our hip, right? So Eric had taken a fall onto his left hip and left some fuzz. What do I mean by fuzz? I'll warn everybody, there's a cadaver picture or cadaver video about ready to come up, so if you're a little sensitive or squeamish, close your eyes. Uh, Eric had left some fuzz in so, his hip. So, we've seen the fuzz. You can see it now. I'll put it in over my voice. The fuzz yields to my fingertip. Sometimes I come across a stronger, thicker strand that doesn't yield to my fingertip. That represents older fuzz sometimes, or maybe it represents the nerve. But each night when you go to sleep, the interfaces between your muscles grow fuzz, potentially. And in the morning when you wake up and you stretch, the fuzz melts. We melt the fuzz. That stiff feeling you have is the solidifying of your tissues. The sliding surfaces aren't sliding anymore. There's fuzz growing in between them. You need to stretch. Every cat in the world gets up in the morning and it stretches its body and it melts the fuzz in the same way that the fuzz melted when I passed my finger through it. When you're moving, it's as if you're passing your finger through the fuzz, just like I did on the cadaver form here. So you have to stretch and move and use your body in order to melt that fuzz that's building up between the sliding surfaces of your musculature. So we get fuzz by taking traumas, but guess what? We get fuzz by sitting over our computers. We get fuzz by sitting over our bikes. One of my favorite expressions, the body is cement waiting to harden. The body is cement waiting to harden, and as you just experienced, motion is lotion. Motion melts the fuzz every morning, loosening our body up. The body's cement waiting to harden, and the bummer is we take these traumas Right? We take these traumas and not only the place that we hit gets injured, but those stresses that go through the system start to leave fuzz. They start to leave injuries. So Eric had taken a fall onto his left hip and he left some dysfunction through his system. He left some dysfunction into his left hip and not only this person's ankle, but their neck and their knee. 20 years earlier, you could leave some fuzz and before you know it, you're starting to have some discomfort through the rest of the system. So back to Gil for a second. Lighting surfaces are all over your body, and the fuzz is all over your body. And as you move, you melt the fuzz. Now what happens if you get an injury? Aha, my shoulder. My shoulder is stiff now. I'm holding my shoulder. I go to bed. I wake up in the morning. I don't stretch my shoulder. I'm afraid it hurts. So I'm walking around like this. Last night's fuzz doesn't get melted. I go to bed. I sleep some more. 
Now I have two nights fuzz built up. Now two nights fuzz is more fuzz than one night's fuzz. What if I have a week's fuzz or a month's fuzz? Now those fuzz fibers start lining up and intertwining and intertwangling and all of a sudden you have thicker fibers forming. You start to have an inhibition of the potential for movement there. It's no longer simply a matter of going, oh, ah, stretch. Now you need some work. Now you might need to do a more systematic exploration of that place to restore the original movement that you lost. And usually this is the case. We have a temporary injury, then we restore our movement. But sometimes we call this aging. The buildup of fuzz amongst the sliding surfaces of our bodies so that our motion becomes limited, the limit cycles become introduced into our normal full range of motion, and we start to walk around like this. We're all fuzzed over. Our body is literally solidifying. Our body is literally solidifying. We walk around like this. We walk around like this. And before we know it, we just can't get ourselves straight again. We leave these little injuries in our body that leave compression points. The duct tape is sitting right here in her calf. And every time I pull her ankle down, that duct tape yanks that fascia. It, it's a nice place of fuzz. Or over here on the right, same thing, a nice place of fuzz here in the hip. Now this bit of duct tape, imagine Velcro stuck together, or you can also imagine two pages of a book that don't slide on one another. We end up with these places in our body and the next thing we know our body is moving around that place. So we're moving around a hip that doesn't move well and the next thing you know the opposite knee hurts. Or we're walking with a rock in our shoe and the next thing you know our ankle not only hurts but so does our low back. So we need to loosen up these places of fuzz and get our systems back in a whole lot of balance. Because remember, one place on the body will affect the next, and if the system's not working well, it's not balanced side to side, it's not balanced up and down, and not only are you likely to have a knee discomfort, but you're likely to have hip or low back pain. And that essentially creates dragging brakes. Right? We all walk into the mechanic and say, or make our bikes work better. But if we had a dragging brake, a brake, that's the first thing we want to do to make ourselves better. We end up with dragging brakes because we end up with one spoke that's tight or one spoke that's loose or an ankle that's stiff. And so when we start to do a squat or we bend down to pick up our kids, we start to do a lunge or push on the pedal, instead of our knee tracking straight, in Eric's case, the knee starts to drop in, the hip starts to drive into the knee. And the dragging brakes starts to push on everything. So our goal is really to start to get the body loose so that we might not be able to do this, right? Anybody recognize that guy, anybody? Peter Sagan, Peter Sagan right? Amazing, just freaking amazing. Um, and yes, he is gonna make it. Probably my favorite part of this video happens right, A, he makes it down to the bottom, wow. But right here when this guy's like, Hey, check that out, man. That's freaking amazing, right? That's freaking amazing. And little did he know, or he probably didn't know who he was looking at. And not only does Peter have amazing flexibility, but this is also the guy that can ride up on a car and park his bike. Amazing coordination and freaking phenomenal strength. So we need flexibility in order to squat down. We need flexibility to get in our drops. We need flexibility just to walk efficiently. So flexibility, mobility is our number one. Our number two is to start to work on strength, core strength specifically, because our brains are programmable and we're the programmers. Our brain is responsible for being the conductor to these muscles deep in our body. It's been said, I love Bob Donatelli's quote, he's a PT that's well known in our industry. We might, we must activate the right muscles at the right time in the right amount in the correct sequence. We need to be the conductor of all of these muscles. And so often what happens is our brain starts to get discoordinated or discombobulated. Discombobulated, that's a technical term. Our brain starts to get discombobulated with how we move. We've had a rock in our shoe, we learned how to move improperly. So we need to wake up these deep core muscles. Now you've been hearing a whole bunch about the core, I'm sure, over the last decade. But really what I'd like you to think about is the core is the deep muscles of the body that helps the body move efficiently. It's kind of like if your biceps are the cannons, if your quads are the cannons, our core is the muscles that make sure that those big muscles 
Those big muscles are producing power, but the core creates the battleship at which they fire from. So if you fired a quad on a canoe, you got a problem. You need to make sure that you fire this bicep. You need to make sure that you fire the bicep on a really strong rotator cuff. You need to make sure that you fire all your calf muscles on a strong, healthy foot. And that's what actually happened to Eric. Eric, when he would just stand and his calves and his quad would fire, his foot would drop. This is him just relaxing his foot. And as soon as he would relax his foot, his whole knee chain would collapse. So you, thought, you saw that knee move earlier and how that knee would drop in. That was driven from a poor coordination in the foot. Here's what that looks like actually inside the shoe. This is a pressure mapping system I use. So on his left foot, he has nice stability. Stability on the big toe side, little toe side. He's got equal pressure across the foot, even more stable. But on his right foot, can you see how he can't connect over here? That is his foot pushing from the outside and he can't get this half of the bipod down. So as soon as he puts pressure on the outside, his whole knee collapses because this half just falls in. The pressure mapping has been really helpful for me, whether it be in the shoe or on the saddle, to see what's happening inside. So number one, mobility. Number two, retrain those deep core muscles, whether they be the foot or the shoulder or deep in the abdomen. And then number three, we need to retrain form. We need to retrain form because our software gets out of date. Our brain forgets how to move efficiently. Again, come back to the rock in the shoe. Or better yet, research, fMRI research. You take two fingers and you tie them together for 20 minutes. In 20 minutes, the brain starts to see those two fingers as one. 20 minutes. So you walk around with a rock in your shoe for half a day or you sprain your ankle. A couple of days later, your software is out of date. And we need to reload and retrain that part of the brain called the homunculus to retrain good form. Get the conductor working well again so that it retrains the right sequence of muscles. So Eric, this was his original, he said, okay, here's how I normally squat, here's how I normally push down on the pedal. I need to retrain him how to connect with his big toe and you'll see him start to do it here. His first metatarsal, the inside of his foot is re being reminded how to get down to the ground or of course down to the pedal. And then he goes, okay, I think I can do this. I, yeah, ah, that's better. I'm not, yeah, yeah, there it is. I'm a little unstable, but as soon as he got his first met down to the ground, his knee started to straighten out. I needed to train him off the bike, simple exercises, and then I needed to train him on the bike with more complex exercises. This could be learning to walk again, this could be learning to swim again, this could learning, be learning how to squat again. Because at the end of the day, if you don't relearn really good form, then you're just gonna go back to moving the way you've always moved. You're just gonna go back to moving the way you've always moved unless you learn good form. One of my favorite examples, I had the um, opportunity to work with Christian a couple of years ago, and Christian would swear that this was straight up and down. He had taken a fall on this right hip. You never fall on the hip, do you? And he had taken a fall on this right hip, and he was um, convinced that this was straight up and down. He said, you know, Curtis, when the stars are aligned, I can connect with my right leg. I've got good power in my right leg, but that would happen every week or every month. You know, I just can't get connected with it. And the difference between here and there was this. He needed to learn how to sit into his right sit bone. I wasn't a very good videographer here, but he needed to learn how to sit into his right sit bone because his whole torso and his whole pelvis, let me back up, see if I can't catch that one more time. His whole torso and his pelvis had learned how to tip to the left and he forgot how to elongate on the right. His form, his software needed to be reprogrammed because he thought straight wasn't quite so straight anymore. Most people want this from me. <laughs> they walk in my office expecting this, right? And I'm afraid what I usually end up offering and what I end up doing is this. And then they get really disappointed in me because I tell them to go home and do this. Right, go home, do some exercises. We got a project here. And sometimes it's like chiseling away at Mount Rushmore is the truth. We need to up, open up your posture and get you healthier again. So if you want to ride like some of my clients, you got to get in the gym and do some of your work. This is, again, Peter um, doing some pull-ups. Yes, professional cyclists work their arms. And do some squats. And maybe even go out and have some fun and do some jump rope. 
Cross-training is critical for the elite level cyclist. Cross-training is critical for us to be able to bend over and pick up the gallon of milk out of the bottom of the refrigerator and not hurt our backs or our knees. So we start at the bottom of the pyramid and we work on health, flexibility, strength, form. We start at the bottom of the, the pyramid and work on health. What's our cardiovascular health like? Are we eating good food? All of those things create a foundation for fitness. And then finally we work on performance. Uh, most of my clients walk in and they say, you know, I want that king of the mountain. I want that five or 10 extra watts. Who cares about sleep? And they're working on the performance end and they never really get to the health end. For me, when I took my injury, one of the things I needed to learn is cross training, get in the pool, get in the gym, get enough sleep. I needed to diversify my musculoskeletal health and I needed to diversify my time across my other bank account pieces. Speaking of other pieces, other pieces of the pie. We've talked a lot about physical. Physical is where I spend a lot of my day, but you can't just rely on the physical. We need to start now to think about how the other pieces of the pie, the intellectual, the emotional, and maybe even the social, spiritual make a difference. Dan Siegel, just a really, really powerful physician who's been very inspirational for me, talks about this really well in his um, healthy mind platter. Uh, you can dig this up. His, his online um, website is quite good. What are some of the ways we can put health into our mental account? Probably one of the biggest when I think about it, intellectual is this. At any age, we can keep learning and we should keep learning. Because, and the old saying goes, if we don't use this, we lose this. And the more we challenge it, the better it works. Neuroplasticity is now just out there. When I went through school, however many years ago that was, when I went through school, neuroplasticity, quote, didn't exist. Once it broke in the brain or once it was disconnected, it was gone. Now we're really starting to understand that it's possible to continue to get smarter. It's possible to continue to get wiser. So we need to continue to learn. As I mentioned, uh, my client, Greg Hilson, just loves now taking photography and not just spending 20 hours plus a week on his bike. And he's finding a lot more joy and connectedness because he's learned a new skill and it makes him happier, healthier, and probably a better cyclist. At least now he's a cyclist that enjoys the scenery and he's looking around a lot more. Playing. Playing is critical for our intellectual, for our emotional health. To learn to start to see the world around us as a place to play in brings us a lot of joy and brings our intellect a whole lot of health. Mental rest. You know, if you're not spending some time, and this is in Dan Siegel's work, if you're not spending some time decompressing, you know, it's actually okay to watch one of those shows that you zone out for a half an hour or just kind of chill out on the couch. If you're not spending some time mental rest, then you're not doing your brain good. And finally, and some of my favorite research is focus. In research pioneered here at UCSF, scientists have discovered telomere shortness predicts disease and mortality. Disease and mortality. Telomeres are the end caps, the DNA caps that protect the end of our chromosomes. Um, they typically, chromosomes typically shorten with age in response to physiological and psychological stressors. And the real interesting thing is if our minds start wondering, then we start to change our telomere length. What I'm getting at is if we start to work on our ability to stay attentive, stay focused, stay in the moment, then our brains are going to be healthier and our bodies are going to be healthier. Check out some of the telomere research. It's really quite phenomenal how we can change potentially our longevity and certainly our mental health. And because it's all connected, like a spider web, this is some of my favorite research, interventions targeted at improving leg power. You get stronger in your body and you might increase your health and improve your cognitive aging. One piece of the pie helps every other piece of the pie. Get stronger and your brain gets better. You get your brain better and you get stronger. You start to connect with your heart and you might just get smarter. Each piece of this spider web affects every other piece of the spider web. So that's on the intellectual side. Let's talk about emotions, feeling, and being. Oh, boy, probably, um, uh, probably one of the, um, the most meaningful times in my life was uh, working with Ben King. Uh, I worked with him probably a half a dozen years ago now, and I didn't know at the time, 
But Ben had uh, gone through some real challenges when he was a high school athlete, um, really got stuck in some bulimia and get stuck in some other emotional challenges. And I've just been so proud of him uh, for recently his emotional courage, um, his an emotional health and his vulnerability and coming out and talking about it. For me, what this was is just a real indication. I see it so many ch in professional cycling or for that matter in ballet or dance, so much that these stresses, these emotional intellectual stresses, they drain on us a lot. And if we're not intellectually capable, if we're not emotionally capable of dealing with some of these stresses, it can really put us in a challenging place. Um, and to be able to start to work on our emotional bank account, our emotional health can help us um, keep out of some of these holes. And again, um, just really hats off to someone who had the courage to step out and say, here's some of the challenges I've had and here's some of the ways we can move this sport and move our society forward. So, um, that's on the withdrawal side. On the deposit side, and something that's really been hitting me a lot lately, and something that made a huge difference for me and me getting out of the hole that everybody seems to be starting to discover. And I'm so grateful for it. Famous athletes, Kobe Bryant, the Seattle Seahawks, Misty May, Derek Jeter, and the list goes on and on. And of course, locally, you know, here at the Warriors, they're doing mindfulness. They're paying attention. And if you want to perform better, you start to think about these words. If you want to perform better, you know, um, Coach Kerr, focus on joy, mindfulness, compassion, right? If you want to perform better, you think about these words. Forget the emotional health. And so, so many of my clients now are focusing on mindfulness as a way to perform and improve their emotional health. Other deposits, we've just talked a little bit about mindfulness. Um, uh, locally here, Amy Saltzman's got a great book out about mindfulness that's really helped me move along a lot. Uh, the ability to pay attention in the here and now. Paying attention in the here and now with kindness and compassion, with non-judgment, so that we can make better decisions. If you've not looked up mindfulness, if you've not looked up meditation, I really recommend you jump into it. It can make a big difference. For me, just getting, becoming mindful of some of the voices that were inside of my head uh, made a big difference for me to be able to get out of the hole I was in physically. And once I could be mindful of some of those voices, uh, it allowed me to start to make better choices in my life to get healthy. Speaking of emotions, Susan David's work recently, um, not just from a performance standpoint, but if we start to accept and be present with our emotions, if we don't just judge them and push them away or stuff them, if we don't let them control us, but we have the emotional agility to move and be present with emotions, if we have the ability to recognize them and just say, what are they here to tell me? And then move beyond them. And not only in sport, not only in emotional health, but it was one of the most downloaded and read Harvard Business business review articles ever. The business world is catching on to this. And most of my elite level CEOs are talking about emotional agility and emotional health. Finally, compassion. Not this way, but this way. Of course, both. But self-compassion is critical for us to be able to be emotionally healthy and to be able to give to others so we can give to ourselves. If you want forgiveness for your kids, start to think about forgiveness to yourself. Uh, Kristen Neff's work and uh, the work around compassion is just really changing the world out there relative to self-respect and self-love. Gratefulness, really important in this process of um, depositing money into your emotional health account to find gratefulness and joy. I feel, I feel. Do you feel alive? I feel, I feel, I feel happy of myself. I feel happy of yourself too. Give me some thumbs up. Thumbs up everybody All right. for rock and roll. <laughs> You know, remember when you were a kid and you rode a bike and just to be on the bike, it made you smile? It brought joy to your heart? And, and now we look down at our power meter and it's five watts lower and it tells us we're five watts more depressed. You know, we just lost that king of the mountain and now we're sad. You know, this is possible for us. We can start to find gratefulness for the fact that we can ride. We can just be out there on our bikes. We can start to find joy in the sunset. We can start to find joy in the rain. Um, it's possible to just to start to be present with what is and find happiness in that. Because we once had it in us. It's still there. But we get so focused on that watt meter or that king of the mountain or that attachment to getting better at something. And next thing you know, we've really lost what really matters. 
We really lost what really matters and we just start taking money out of the account. Right? Stress, stress, and more stress, more stress. And it takes money out of every account to be stuck in that state. My favorite stress reduction kit, bang head here. Read the directions carefully. I like the third one, repeat as necessary or until unconscious. Stress reduction kit. At minimum, let's start to think like zebras do. You know, zebras, and this book by Robert Sapolsky is really powerful, just so much research and practical information in here. Zebras don't get ulcers because they know when lions are lions. In other words, they don't have a boss that they're worried about. They don't have laundry that they're worried about. They know that the little things in life aren't going to eat them. For us, we get in these sympathetic fight, flight, stress states. We get all riled up because there's a car in front of us that's not going fast enough. We get in sympathetic states. And that sympathetic state tells us to run from a lion. And our body says, if we're going to run from a lion, let's not digest the food in the stomach. If we're going to run from a lion, let's not worry about taking care of that old injury. If we're going to run from a lion, let's not take care of health and healing. So we get in these sympathetic fight or flight states and the next thing you know, we've got ulcers because our body isn't taking care of itself. A parasympathetic state is that body's ability to digest and calm and breathe and settle. And most of the time zebras just eat a lot of grass and they know when to stress out. And then they go back to chilling out again. So start to think about, you know, how important is this thing really, this project at work? Is it going to kill me? How important is this pile of laundry on the floor? Or how important is it for me to get this lecture done in time because it's, uh, right? Oh, take that breath, slow down a little bit, and get back into a parasympathetic state. Because when we can get into the parasympathetic state, it's amazing. Our brains work a whole lot better. We have a whole lot more presence and joy when we're a parasympathetic state. Finally, let's talk about the last piece of the pie. Physical, intellectual, emotional, and social slash spiritual. This has been hitting me a lot lately, right? Just crazy. Loneliness is deadlier than obesity. Research in the U.S. looked at 218 studies, studies, meta-analysis, involving nearly 4 million people. They discovered that lonely people had a 50% increase in risk of death. 50% increased risk of death compared to those with good social connections. In contrast, as you can see here, obesity, 30% increase. Drinking, 30% increase. Obesity, 20%. So what does that mean? It means that next time you get out for a ride, maybe go out with some friends instead of chasing the king of the mountain. Maybe at the end, spend 5, 10, 20 minutes sitting around and having a latte with them. I've done a lot of riding in Europe, and it's amazing. You go for about, you know, two or three hours, you sit down at the coffee shop for 20 minutes, and then you go riding for another hour or two. It's about the social connection. It's about being with your friends and being with your family and really enjoying their company. So start to think about cycling as a group activity, not just as a racing activity. <laughs> One of my favorite, if you get more than two, two guys together, it's the weekly world championships. Right? One person goes off the front and you got to chase them down. And that's, that's me. But start to slow down and connect a little bit. It'll make a big difference in how long you live if you start to connect. Let's not be so lonely, be so disconnected. So that's the social piece. How about the spiritual piece? I'm going to read this. Brene Brown, spirituality is recognizing and celebrating that we are all inextricably connected to each other, inextricably connected to each other by a power than greater than all of us, and that that connection to that power and to one another is grounded in love and compassion. That connection to one another is grounded in love and compassion. If we go back to the blue zones, one of the things that all three of those cultures that live past 100 had in common was a sense of spirituality. And I'm not saying God, I'm just saying a sense of connection to something greater than each other. Uh, Dan Siegel, what's wrong with the human mind? The quantum physics understands that everything is connected, but the human mind doesn't believe it's true. Quantum physics says it's all connected, but we can't see it or believe it. 
It's so, oh, Dan Siegel also, um, spirituality, understanding the purpose and why we're here and understand pers having perspective and meaning to our life. So let's go into some of the uh, deposits. Purpose with life, just really, really critical. Why are we here? Um, how can we contribute? What can we add back into life? How can we give to others and not just for ourselves? And then finally, social connectedness. How can we start to be with our friends and be with our family in a way that really makes a difference? An inspiration for me, I've met him a couple of times, someone who really has his life in balance. If you don't know Jens, um, he, uh, probably the, the, one of the best things is this guy loves to have fun and damn, is he a good athlete. He has a lot of hobbies, geocaching being one of them, and he goes out and spends a lot of time not only with his friends, but with his family. He puts family first and cycling is in the mix. Family first and cycling is in the mix. Um, today I also have in the audience uh, Larry Nolan. Um, Larry has uh, just accomplished so many things in his life, 21 world titles, 52 national titles, and over 130 state titles. One of the things Larry said to me as we started talking about this lecture is uh, his social connection with um, the juniors that he coaches, his social connection by putting on uh, a lot of the races that he does, um, has really made a huge difference in how happy he is in life. And his ability to accomplish those world and national titles has been helped out by those connections. He's, he loves when he is making a difference in people's lives. For me, that's spirituality, having a purpose. Uh, he loves when he gets that aha moment and sees someone light up because they now know how to corner better or they know how to sprint better. That ability to help someone and see your purpose makes a difference for our performance. I'll say that again. Our ability to make a difference in other people's lives and being socially connected, according to Larry and according to so many of our athletes, makes a difference in our performance. Not to mention our ability to connect with our significant others and not to mention our longevity. So... How diversified are you? I'm really curious. Uh, if you think right now for a moment out of 100%, where would you be? Are you spending 80% of your time in the physical and you've only got 20% you know, left for the last three? Where are you in that diversity? Are you spending a whole lot of time in the intellectual? You're, you're really trying to learn. Maybe you're in school and you've got a lot of energy and time focused on, on learning something. Maybe right now you've got that big project at work that you've got a lot of learning to do. Maybe you just have really spent a lot of time recently on the emotional side. Where are you and how balanced are you? Think about the amount of time and energy you're putting into each one of these. Just take a second to toss that around. Where could you put a little bit more energy and time into and what might be the best return on your investment for energy and time? It's like a bank account. If you have all your investments in one account and the market crashes in one account, how diversified are you? How stable and supported are you across all these, all these pieces? Or, like so many, are you just really tipped to one side or the other? So let's come full circle and wrap it up. Wellness. Wellness, according to the National Wellness Institute, is an active process. Becoming aware and making choices to make a healthy and fulfilling life because so often we're stuck here, feeling that way. We're running on society's treadmill. Someone else has put that treadmill in front of us. So let's start doing the things that we finally care about, going the places we really want to go as opposed to just spinning our wheels. And let's start being the people that we want to be and feeling the way we would like to feel as opposed to just being sad and unhappy and depressed. It's so easy to get stuck in those places. And next thing you know, we're unhappy and we don't need to be there. Our performance is going south and we don't need to be there. Too often, we just continue to climb whatever ladder is in front of us. That ladder of success, get to the top of that chain, whatever that chain is. Yay, we've accomplished our goal, but then Right? It's leaning up against the wrong building. Or maybe you've chose the right building, but right? 
It's up against the wrong wall. Yay, I've got more money in my bank account, but I'm not any happier. Yay, I've reached the king of the mountain. Look at all that wattage I've got sitting there. But next thing you know, you're just not feeling much joy, gratefulness, fulfillment. So no matter how long we run on this treadmill, it'll never be enough to fill the holes that we really want to fill, the happiness hole, the joy, the fulfillment hole. Never enough beauty, never enough money, never enough accomplishment. Because in the final analysis, we find ourselves here. I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. I wish I hadn't worked so hard um, I wish I'd been a little bit more carefree. I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends. And I wish I had let myself feel happier. All of these things are possible now. Probably best stated in some of this. Right? Such an amazing thinker. Such an amazing thinker. Our time is limited. Follow our heart and intuition. Everything else is secondary. Everything else is secondary. So let's start making decisions that make sense for our life. Because the consequences of today are determined by the actions of the past. That is what it was. That's the past. A friend of mine once said, long before I learned about mindfulness and meditation and being present, a friend of mine once said, Curtis, if you've got a foot in the past and if you've got a foot in the future, you're just pissing on the present. Right? <laughs> Probably one of the best Buddhist statements I've heard. So if we want to change our future, we need to alter our decisions today. Uh, and I was stuck in one of these holes, these places. I was just running on the treadmill, and I was having a, such a hard time of moving out of the hole. And I was talking to a friend of mine about it. And he said, Curtis, you know the first rule of holes, don't you? And I said, what do you mean the first rule of holes? He said, the first rule of holes is to stop digging. If you want to get out of a hole, the first rule is to stop digging. Just start figuring out where your time and energy is going that's not serving you anymore. And as I start to think about the places we're spending time and energy that's not serving us or not serving me, so often I end up with, am I watching TV too much instead of connecting with my friends and my family? Am I sitting on the phone too much? Tristan Harris, uh, Center for Humane Technology, one of my favorite quotes, reversing the digital attention crisis, realigning technology with humanity's best interests. The number of times we open up the phone in a day and the number of hours we're spending on it, four-ish hours per person per day. It's amazing that we sit at dinner tables and we're staring at our phones instead of the people across from us. So start to look at the place that you're spending your time and start to look at where you can start to see, steal some of that time and put it into something that's more valuable for you. Emotionally getting deeper inside of yourself, connecting with that person across the dinner table, maybe even setting the phone in the other room while you have dinner. Maybe it's you're putting a little bit too much time or energy into work relative to where your goals are. So what really matters the most to you? This is what it comes down to. Think about something that you really care about. Maybe it's being a better mom or dad, and maybe it's that double century, maybe it's getting a promotion. Think about something you really care about. Maybe it was one of your goals this year or your New Year's resolutions. Think about something that you wanted to do or someone that you wanted to become, and think about that thing. And then how much energy or time are you putting into it? Are you putting the amount of time and energy three out of 10, but maybe you're putting all that energy into becoming a better double century rider? Maybe you're putting a lot of time and energy into getting a promotion and you really wish you were a better mom or dad or a better friend. So toss that around for a second and just start to go deep and ask yourself some questions. Um, because I, as I've heard, if we're not assessing, we're guessing. And so often, so often, and I love this quote, it's really hard to read the label from inside the jar. It's really hard to read the label from inside the jar. So ask your friends about this, especially ask your spouse about this, right? Ask your spouse, hey, am I putting energy and time into the place that I really care about and the place that we really care about? Because it's so hard to know where we're at unless we're looking at it from the outside and maybe even occasionally looking at it from the inside. So there we go. Start to make deposits into our lowest account 
whether that be the spiritual, whether that be the emotional. Many of us are doing a lot of time and energy in the intellectual and start to um, feel how much of a difference that makes in every other piece, especially spending time with friends and family. Can't say enough about how important that is. Because at the end of the day, if we always do what we've always done, then we'll always get what we've always gotten, right? Tony Robinson and the definition of insanity. Because at the end of the day, you know, when I get to 70, 80 or above, I want to be a whole lot more like this. Meet the 86 year old nun who takes on triathlons after church hours. The only failure is not to try. She's the Iron Nun, also known as Sister Madonna Buter. At 86 years old, she's broken more barriers than many people half her age, competing in more than 40 Ironman triathlons, a challenge that would still be tough for someone one-fourth her age. Each triathlon consists of a 2.4-mile swim, 112-mile bike ride, and 26.2-mile run. Sister Madonna was first introduced to running when she was 48 years old by a priest who encouraged it as a way to harmonize the mind, body, and soul. Now, Sister Madonna has integrated training into her everyday life. So with that, yeah, right, start, start to think forward. Thank you so much. Have a whole lot of fun. And when in doubt, try to keep the rubber side down. Thank you. We're going to open it up to questions. Ah, thank you. You know, I'm, I'm lucky, to, uh, the question is, um, we're in an incredible time uh, where there's people on the edge and there's people with a fair bit of um, uh, money in their account, if you will. How do, we, um, how do we start to get this information or information in general to people who are on the edge? And do I work with people um, who don't have a lot of financial resources, what I assume you're chatting about? You know, for, um, for all the, and it's not sitting here, but for, for all the crap I give one of these, and I'm really trying to use this a whole lot less, I'm grateful for the information that's gonna come through these. You know, the, um, the number of people nationally and internationally that are having phones and have access to free information. This lecture will be free online for anybody who wants to dig into it. You know, all the, all the university stuff that's popping up online. So, um, so it's out there, it's really getting out there. And whether that be nationally or internationally, the number of cell phones towers that are popping up in India and the number of people that have cell phones and access to free information is going through the roof. So information and information dissemination that's free, um, I'm really grateful to see it out there. And then of course I do work with a fair number of clients in the valley that have large bank accounts and I do a whole lot of, um, a whole lot of figuring out how to get people into, into the office to make sure that they can have access. Thank you very much for that. Great question. So I talk a lot about um, mobility work, stretching. I talk a lot about core stability and uh, strength. And is it seasonal or is that something we need to carry through, if I've got your question? So let me divide that into two categories. First to say um, the strength piece of it depends upon age. If you're 30-year-old, 25-year-old and under and you're an elite level cyclist, um, it, a lot of strength training can be really detrimental to the performance. But if I leave that aside, you're 30, 35, 40, Keeping in the gym to some extent uh, throughout the year can be really valuable. That's the strength piece. Even if it's just once a week to maintain strength will help your performance. So that's strength. Yes, keep some of it in, in throughout the year, unless you're that tiny little bit. And if you're 25 years and younger, strength training probably in the off season. Uh, but then the other two pieces that were there, the mobility and some of the core. Every athlete I know at a high level does, um, not every athlete, that's a big word, most athletes, almost every athlete I know does some mobility training, stretching, foam rolling, et cetera, and or some core and core local muscle stability work. Uh, and they find that the more mobile they are, think about Peter Sagan for a moment, the more mobile they are, the longer they can stay in their aero bars. The more mobile they are, the less that hip or that knee hurts, that old accident. So working on mobility, day in and day out. Uh, if you watch almost every elite level athlete before they hop on the bike or they hop on the field, they'll go through a mobility program, they'll through, go through a little bit of a core, priming the pump. Wake up your core, wake up your mobility before you hop on the bike. That way once you hop on the bike or you go out and you train hard, that mobility and that core control, real, realigning the brain, makes a big difference for how well we perform. So keep those in year round almost daily. It's like brushing your teeth, right? 
We, we brush our teeth every day, twice a day. Mobility is flossing our body. Every cat in the world stretches. And not just that whole mobility, but floss that area that hit the ground a little bit more uh, and wake up that core a little bit relative to the way that you had a surgery some years ago. So keep mobility in year round, um, keep core strength in year round, and then there's a tiny little section where you can have a debate about strength training and whether you go year round with that. Yeah, great question, really great question. What's the medical term for fuzz? Adhesions, uh, adhesions. You get one, uh, one surface not sliding on the other. If my shirt was glued to my skin, I wouldn't move very well. So fuzz or adhesions, and uh, it's amazing. Uh, the oil between each layer starts to dry up, and the next thing you know, you've got stickiness. Uh, medical term for fuzz, thank you. Yeah, as we get older, what's the best way to help our fuzz out is the question. Are there certain types of exercises that really improve fuzz more, improve the mobility around fuzz? You know, I'd say that that's more specific to the person. Uh, what I would say is um, that what I would say is this, make sure that there's some soft tissue mobility in there. What I mean by that is hop on a ball and roll out your hip or hop on the foam roller. Make sure there's some type of self massage that's in the list and then make sure there's some type of strength training through your entire range. Um, so whether that's, you know, yoga strengthening toward the end of the range or whether that's, you know, getting into the gym and making sure you're really stretching out and strengthening those hamstrings. So I would say mobility work, number one, and massage, and then number two, some sort of strength training through the entire range. Both of those will improve those layers sliding and gliding on one another. Great question. Yeah, so I, if I'm hearing the question right is, as we walk into, especially a Western medicine um, physician, and we have an injury or an issue, um, how does an average person, you know, walk into that physician's office or that healthcare practitioner's office and say, you know, I would like to look at this from a sy sy systemic standpoint as opposed to, you know, let's just point to where it hurts. Is, is that what I'm hearing? Um, so number one, walk in as educated as you can. Um, you know, go online and do some of that research. Don't be afraid by the crazy story out there, but just start to understand, you know, A, things are interconnected, as you've seen here. So go in as educated as you can, whether that be a musculoskeletal issue or whether that be a visceral, visceral or vascular issue. Um, having some ideas and some questions. It's, um, and go in with questions. Hey, could this be this or could this be that? Um, uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, be the investigator of your own body. And here's what I mean by that. I'll never, for, I'll never forget this. Um, uh, a close friend of mine, uh, this has been 20 plus years ago when I was a new PT, um, she was having shoulder pain. And as a new, a new grad, a new PT, I was like, hey, we can help that, we can fix that. And, um, and one day, you know, three or four visits into it, and I was just kind of helping her as a friend, three or four visits into it, she said, Curtis, there's this really weird thing that happens to me in that, you know, when I wake up in the middle of the night and my shoulder hurts, if I just eat something, I feel better. I went, what? If you eat something and you feel better? And um, we came to find out that the gallbladder refers to the left shoulder. <laughs> And so what I'm getting at is if you start to listen to your body and you start to go, boy, every, every time I, I do a deep squat, my left shoulder hurts. Or every time I sit too much, my neck hurts. Or it's interesting that you know, I have these headaches in the middle of the night. If you can go in with a lot of information about your body, you can start to tease out. Basically, you become the investigator. And a lot of these things that you might not be able to piece together, someone with a, a good medical background who's open to this interconnectedness can start to piece things together. That's number one. So be a good investigator. Listen to your body. Go into it with as much information as you can. Number two, if, if you're not connecting with the health care practitioner that you're working with and a couple of visits into it, you're not moving forward and you're not getting good answers, know that there's someone else out there that might be able to help you out, whether it's a different doc of the same profession or whether it's a functional medicine doctor. The number of people I send out to, hey, the physical therapy is not working. Let's try acupuncture or let's try chiro or let's get you back to your doctor because this seems to be not musculoskeletal. So don't give up hope and keep searching through the system. Some people find me a year or two years into problems. And if it's not working relatively quickly, you're not seeing changes, then ask that question, is this time to change? So um, go into it with knowing that there's an answer out there, change if it's not working, and really be the investigator of your own body and come in with as much information as you can. Yeah, great question, thank you. Other questions? 
Okay then. So um, with that, I just want to leave you with a, a couple of things um, since I've just got a, a minute or two. Um, probably um, some of my favorite books out there around change because some of this comes back to change. How do we start to change our habits? Duhigg, uh, Duhigg's book on habit change is amazing. Switch, um, the, the book Switch by Chip and Dan Heath is really amazing. They talk about our... Um, our conscious brain is like a rider, and that rider, that conscious brain, is sitting on an elephant. And that elephant is our subconscious, or it's our homunculus. It's that place that it does all the work for us every day. And the rider wants a different habit, but the elephant is going, no, I want to go down that road. And the elephant almost always takes us down that road that it feels safer with. So um, in Chip and Dan Heath's book, Switch, they talk about how to start to train your elephant. How do we start to make changes in our habits so that way the rider is starting to control the elephant as opposed to the other way around. I really love that analogy and they go deep into that analogy. How do we start to make the path that the elephant wants to ride around? And even how do we make it so the elephant it has a hard time reaching out for the M&Ms that's sitting on the table? You know, make it easier for the apple that's already sitting there. Making habits, breaking habits, and of course Gretchen Rubin's work on um, habits is really nice. Um, and then Stephen, boy, Stephen started it so long ago. Um, just an amazing person. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. If you've not been through that book, it's great for all of us. Okay, so with that, unless there's any other questions, I think we will wrap it for the night. I am here for questions, and you guys have been a great audience. Thank you. Thank you.